Laura McGoldrick, welcome to Between Two Beers. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. We're delighted to have you. It's it's rather late on a school night. I understand you've just got the, uh, the two kids to, to bed. Everything going all right in the McGoldrick house tonight? Everything is going just swimmingly. I'm I'm just waiting for when I have to raise my hand and say, look, I'm just going to go and sort something out. But no, it's all going very well. Thank you. Not bad for a is it Wednesday? I don't know what day it is, but um, all going good. Thanks. How's, how's things in level two? You enjoying yourselves? It's nice. nice. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, Che and I are across uh, the computer from each other, enjoying. Oh, it must be nice. Feeling, feeling, feeling for you guys though. How is the mood? I understand. Have you been doing it by yourself, uh, Guppy? Can I call him Guppy? Is, is You're allowed to call him Guppy. That's fine. He's, um, yeah, he's no, he's yet. he's away. So we're about three weeks into a good thirteen week stint. So. Um, yeah, no, it's all good. It's all good so far. It's not like I can go far, which is, well, it's interesting. It's interesting for uh, trying to explain to a three-year-old why you can't go to the playground or why she can't go to kindy. So it seems really strange that a three-year-old goes, oh, no, we can't do that because we're in lockdown. I'm like, yeah, we are in lockdown. It's a weird thing for you to know. But anyway, such is life, eh? It does sound harsh, yeah. Um, the way we do things at Between Two Beers, we like to tell the audience how we know the guest. Uh, so, Shay, how do you know Laura? Well, Laura interviewed me at Waikato Stadium. I don't know if you remember that. It I was do. during the Chiefs game, and I actually got into a little bit of strife with Chiefs management for an unsanctioned appearance. I was uh, at the stadium. I was in preparation for the FIFA Under-20 um, World Cup that we had here in New Zealand. I was the venue manager for Hamilton. And I don't claim to know Laura particularly well, but I was also actually a guest at Laura and Martin Guptill's wedding. Um, yeah, you still owe me dinner, but that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> it was an incredible, incredible night. Um, we might touch on a little bit of that later. But um, Stevie, you you were at the Herald. I think you crossed paths at the same time. But did you come across Laura in a professional context? Well, uh, hang on a minute, Jay. I don't think you can just say it was an incredible, incredible <laughs> night. Mention you were at her wedding, but you vaguely know each other. Laura, do you remember Seamus being no, at we your wedding? We don't have to do I this. certainly do, actually. I, I certainly do. Um, his ex-partner is a, a friend of mine and was was uh, was there with them as well. It wasn't like I just started chucking out um, invites <laughs> really nearly to this dude I interviewed um, uh, for Sky Sports Select at, at Waikato Stadium. Um, no, uh, I do remember him being there. Uh, you had a shorter beard, I think, then. I remember your tuxedo. You looked great. You, you offered a lot on the dance floor, which I think um, is really important for any wedding guest. Um, but yeah, like I say, I'm still waiting for a, a drink or a or a dinner. Do you just you know? I'll rough. I'll, I'll sort that out. I, I will yeah, sort thanks. that out. Yeah, I do thanks. have to. I do have to thank you. I actually had my um, my anniversary with Daryl Tuffy um, on your wedding anniversary. I keep in contact with him, strangely enough after the wedding so um thank you very much for that it was oh, a surreal, my great pleasure. surreal night <laughs> i you, you had i had the pleasure of, of being on a table with um shane bond the late sir martin crow daryl tuffy um ross taylor's wife victoria who's from hamilton as well it was um it was it was pretty awesome it's a shame you couldn't be there steve <laughs> yeah i'm sorry about that steve that does feel like a shame now it does. I'm the odd one out. We actually had um, Matt Heath on an earlier episode, um, and we talked a little bit about your wedding at the start. And he recalled the story about how later in the night you had a few wines, perhaps, and you were really, really Me? pushing him to sing his uh, Deja Voodoo song, Beers. And he was like, I didn't know the song. Like, I didn't really used to sing it. It wasn't me. I didn't, I didn't want to do it at all. But <laughs> Well, you see, the thing with Matt there was, is, so my family's from Timaru, and today, tomorrow, Timaru. Not many yeah. people sang songs about Timaru. So we were all fit. All my cousins that were there, there's about 200 of us, um, McGoldrick, good Catholic family. And so we were like, oh, come on, Matt, you know. Come on, Matt. There was a lot, a lot of my older um, cousins were like, come, seriously, Matt, come on. And he's like, oh. <laughs> I had somehow managed to, and it was, all, I mean, I don't know what happened, but I had some, had sort of commandeered the microphone and decided I would sort of take it to some sort of karaoke night. I don't, I don't really know how it happened. I Very looked good. so in my wedding dress. <laughs> I entered the night at McDonald's. But um, yeah, so uh, yeah, Matt got up and really, he, I'm not, I don't want to say he blew it because he didn't blow it. He just didn't know any of the words. We knew more than he did, which was interesting. It, um, 
I remember I was, I mean, I've got, I've got flashes towards the end of the night, but I look back both. now with, <laughs> with great regret. Some of my, um, my man love towards Jeremy Wells, I was just absolutely effusive in my praise for eating media lunch. He, I don't think he could have cared less about that, but for me, it was a massive, it was a massive, massive moment. That I and seeing Jason Gunn emceeing, that was awesome. He was good, eh? He, um, he did the, what memory did the 12th man? For, uh, the, we had a lot of speeches. Um, funny there. Uh, you know, it was don't worry. You got to shoot your shot when you're with Jeremy Wells and you want to tell him how much you love him. You got to you got to go in there. So don't don't feel bad about that. It's, it's now, one last thing before we maybe leave the wedding. <laughs> um, do you recall who caught the bouquet? Kylie. Yeah, yeah. In how front did of that go the, for you, if you don't mind my well, asking. I mean, Tradition would suggest. Oh. <laughs> She doesn't listen very often. I'll say this. He, he does mention her in every episode. Yeah, I do mention her. <laughs> I'll, I'll, say, I'll, I'll say this. That was about the third bouquet that she caught. So I did somewhere along the line I had a I had a nightmare. But um Ross Taylor was actually egging on the CEO, the then CEO of ANZ, telling him that he had to pay for Kylie's wedding. Um, and then I bumped into him down here in Hamilton. He said, how's the, how's everything going? And I had to kind of break it to him that it hadn't really panned out. You didn't pay for the wedding. So I didn't hear, I didn't nothing. Exactly. Yeah. Right. We'll leave the wedding. Okay. We'll leave okay. The wedding. Okay. It was great for us. We were there. Everyone else. Very good. And I will, I will, I will repay the favor at some point. Maybe. <laughs> great. Own, I can't wait. In the future. I, 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 I'm really good at weddings. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the way we do things at Between Two Beers is we like to canvas your sort of colleagues and friends and ask them a little bit about you so we can perhaps go a little bit deeper. Um, one of the people we contacted was actually Tony Street, who obviously works close with you on Breakfast on the Hits. Um, and she said, Laura is fiercely loyal, passionate, and has an incredible work ethic. She's not afraid to say what she thinks, and family and friends are the centre of her world which we thought was really nice. Now, the other person who we got in contact with, um, and this one went down an alley we weren't quite expecting. Um, uh -huh. but he's a big fan of the podcast and is quite a prolific voice in the sport media world these days. Um, and when we asked, you know, what do you know of Laura McGoldrick? He said this, he said, um, I took her to my school leavers ball. She's my best mate's sister. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> and, it, and it was a top notch night, but, I think she danced with my dad more than me. Sad face emoji. <laughs> His dad did offer up a lot of good moves. Um. <laughs> how, so how, Guy Havel? Where, yeah, so Guy, Guy Havel, TVNZ. How did this, I mean, he's friends with your brother, but how did mm. this come about? Because you're a couple of years older than him, right? I'm just the one. Or maybe, okay. you no, know, I think I'm only one year older than him. Um, so I don't think it's creepy. But, um, or might be. Um, but Guy is a wonderful, a wonderful, oh, he's basically part of our family. Um, he's been mates with my brother for many, many years. Um, he went to the same school as um, my brother Christopher and a uh, good college boy, loves his sport, loves his cricket. He was, we're always bound to get on. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I might have just said, oh, I'll come to your ball with you. I don't even, he probably had another date. I'm quite, um, what's the word? <laughs> I maybe it was less of a suggestion and more about you're taking me um, a command. Perhaps, I'm not sure, um, but we, we it was a great night. I mean, I don't think he 100% banked on his on his date having a quick spew in fish and chips in Christchurch after the the ball. But I mean, I came back. I came back stronger than ever, and we had a wonderful time. And it, as it transpired, we ended up working together. And he is yeah, he's a great he's a great lad. Oh, that's too good a story. I was hoping it was going to be some sort of pity thing where he put a social media post up and said, if I get 5,000 likes, Laura McGoldrick will come to my school ball. So that's a shame. No, <laughs> no, no. Guy, no, no. It was not, I think it was more like, you should take me. Take me. Take me to the ball. Very good. Nice. Um, we're going to go all over the place tonight, Laura, but the place we want to start, and, and I hope it doesn't bring back too many painful memories, is the Cricket World Cup final. Um, the recent super over, your husband was obviously doing the business. Um, so we had Jimmy Neesham on uh, a couple of podcasts ago, and we, he sort of relived his version. And it got us thinking, because you were there as a wife, but also as a professional in a working capacity, who... Well, I think you're working for Sky, right? And you had some professional duties to undertake as soon as the game was over. So 
first of all, that's nerve wracking on its own, you know, especially with a game in the balance, thinking about what you're going to say, what questions you're going to ask. <laughs> but how much more is there added on to when it's your husband out there batting? Um, I think that was probably one of the worst games for the the professional and um, the wife line getting really blurred. It was a really challenging thing because my memories of that day and, and that game, I mean, I think I think it will be the greatest game, one day game of cricket ever played, but I'll never ever be able to watch it again. I can't even watch the highlights of a couple of the balls of the super over. Um, it's weird. I wasn't playing the game. I had skin in the game. Um, being a Kiwi and obviously having Guppy there. Um, but there was this really wonderful atmosphere that day and going to the ground and you'd walk past people in Kiwis like Lane who had flown and had just landed and, and, and got there in time, uh, Mike Lane that is, um, and, and, and arrived at the game and they were just so fizzed and hyped and those are the days when you could travel and masks were not a thing. And it was awesome and and there was a there was a contingent of kiwis that sat in this one area of the ground and it was actually directly above where the families um were sitting and you, i swear they were you, they were drowning out the rest of the palms it was just magnificent the noises they were making every time you saw a kiwi they'd go laura we're gonna win the world cup and i would absolutely turn to them and go oh, i know <laughs> because it was just this, this overwhelming feeling of oh my god these Boys are going to do something really special. And I, I've got goosebumps even thinking about it because it really was. And I can't describe it. I've never gone to a game of cricket and been so sure of a result. And like Guy Havelt was there and we were texting each other throughout. Like, is it enough? Yes, it's enough. I reckon they've got, yeah, no. And it was just this constant back and forth. But there was never any doubt that we were going to win. Did we deserve it more? Maybe. Um, they're just a great bunch of lads. They We had had a wonderful trip. Um, as a family and professionally for me, I mean, any time that you get to travel um, for a, get to, to watch cricket and talk to the players who are such legends, I mean, what a privilege. But um, going as a family, you know, the New Zealand, the Black Caps had done a wonderful job of creating this really awesome environment where, you know, it's these boys on this common journey, as are the, the women with their children. You know, not many people can understand what it's really like. Um, taking your kid on tour and, and trying to get him to sleep and help your husband, you know, be the best version of himself he can be on the cricket field the next day. So it was actually, we, we had such a lovely, lovely special time together. And there were a couple of howler games sort of towards the end. Um, uh, one springs to mind against England where it was just like, whew, what happened there? <laughs> um, yeah. But there was always this feeling that this team could do something really special. There was a great game against the West Indies. You might remember it came down to like the last over. And I was like, geez, if they can find a way to win and win ugly, surely, you know, anything can happen. And and, and there was this just real feeling of, oh, my God, we're going to win a World Cup. It was obviously um, a tough tournament for Guppy. Um, but um, he was really, you know, Guppy's got an incredible work ethic and he's, um, you know, if it gets tougher he worked harder and I was just so proud of the way he kept kept turning up and kept working hard and you know kept doing all that he could feeling like a demon can I just say I mean wow uh, let's talk about Dooney no um but anyway so um anyway we had that amazing semi-final and so it was we well, just felt like momentum was at an all-time high and you go to the game you see these people you hear the Kiwis you watch it all and there were so many little things and you're like, what the hell is going on here? But at the end of the game, after the, I, tell you, I, I haven't actually told many people this, um, just before the last ball of that super over, someone said to me, tapped me on the shoulder, I don't talk a lot during, which will surprise a lot of people, but particularly when Guppy's batting. I don't talk, I can't, because I'm not sure I can really breathe much. Um, he's fine, I'm not. Um, and I was holding our daughter, we only had one child at that stage. I was holding our daughter and it was like she knew something that was going on because everyone had sort of got very quiet. It was quite bizarre because where the families were sat, there was the New Zealand families and then there was a velvet rope, a red velvet rope, and then the English families. And we'd all played very nice at the beginning and every... <laughs> clap, clap, you know, nicey, nicey. By the end of it, one of the English boys' mothers was standing at the edge of the balcony, thrusting at it, going, this is what you've been training for! And everyone was like, what the hell? I went to go inside. I remember slapping my hands on tables, smacking the roof. Like, it was, I mean, it was very, it was very special. Um, so it, it, at the end, it was sort of this very bizarre feeling like we wanted to 
cry because we felt our boys deserved it and they'd been kind of robbed and they didn't actually lose. And then you've got the English woman carrying on like, I just can't, it was like, I don't, I can't actually see that. That's not really helping me right now. Um, but anyway, so just before that last ball was bowled, someone tapped me on the shoulder, one of the other partners, just before uh, Joffre Archer ran into to bowl to Guppy and she said, it's going to be okay because good things happen to good people. Oh. And, and that was something that I think it might have even been Brendan McCullum started when he was captaining after the 2015 World Cup or even during. Good things happen to good people. And and these are a bunch of really, really good people. And so you're like, yeah. And at that time, I thought to myself, I cannot believe you just said that to me. <laughs> that was awesome. But, um, but then, then I was like, you know what? She's absolutely right. And I just remember the noise the screaming my daughter was mortified because I was just making so much noise and I don't like I say notoriously say a lot and then I just remember sitting down and it felt like everyone sat down on top of me and I was just holding Harley and like I couldn't look up but all you could hear was screaming and fireworks and England win and blah. and it was just and you're watching the English boys run around and I can just all I can see is Guppy on his haunches and I'm thinking oh my god I don't really know what to do here and then Colin Munro's wife said to me you put your head up we will never experience anything like this ever again you soak it up I know it hurts and I'm like okay yeah 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 okay you're right you're right you're right and then I had to wipe my face pick my kid my pram my bag walk downstairs walk onto the field take Harley onto the field because at this point no one can get anywhere because everyone has won. The English have won. Uh, and then so no one's sort of moving. So I had to take Harley onto the field and thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to have to do these interviews with her on a hip. That's fine. No worries. You can handle that. You can't take your pram on me, miss. Yeah, well, look, at this point, I'll do whatever I like. Thanks very much. Because it's <laughs> robbed. No, but that, anyway, so we got onto the field. And I just remember seeing, because actually all of the girls just, we just wanted to get to the boys because you just you just like felt like you needed to hug them and say it's good, it's it's okay, it's going to be okay. It doesn't feel it right now, <laughs> but it's going to be okay. Um, but then we got out on the field and I interviewed. Um, like Jimmy was crying, and Jimmy is not a hugely emotional guy. Guppy was white as a ghost. Even Brendan McCullum, who was doing his commentary duties, came over and he's like, I I, I don't I don't even know what to say, and I. And, and no one did. It was this really strange feeling. And I'm thinking to myself, the hell am I going to ask anyone? Because they don't want to talk. I don't want to talk. I would like a very large glass of something. And <laughs> I would like to just sit down and have a wee cry. And, you know, being um, lucky enough to walk onto the field after something like that happens, you know, you see the, the ecstasy and the agony, as, as Smithy said. And, you know, the English boys, a lot of them are our mates, our, our friends that we have, you know, through the years, IPL teams, whatever you spent time with and one of them is Johnny Bearstow and Johnny Bearstow is a lovely lovely guy and he came over to me and he he said oh god Laurie he said oh I'm just so sorry and he put his hand on me and I was like you get away from me Johnny this is <laughs> right now. I just can't and he's like oh sorry I'm sorry this is my mum and I'm like honestly you're not the person I want to meet either <laughs> lovely to meet you ma'am uh, Mrs Bearstow lovely to meet you they were gorgeous they were lovely but you know there was a there were, you know, there was just this really, it was a very, very strange thing. It was very strange to go to work after that and interview these players. And I interviewed Gary Stead and he said to me, it was sort of profound in this moment of just utter chaos. He said, maybe England just needed to win it more than we did today. And I'm like, I don't even understand what that means. I really just don't even understand what that means, Gary. And then I walked away going, what does that mean? But the whole thing completely stopped for me when Emirates sponsor the ICC, so Emirates are the main sponsor so for the ICC Crew World Cup. So Emirates were very, very much there. And we were standing, I was standing with the late Alan Henderson, who was my producer there on the ground, and Kerry Russell, who was my cameraman, and uh, both wonderful men. And this woman, all dolled up in her beautiful um, uh, Emirates uniform, came over as they're preparing to give out the medal. And, um, and she came over and she said, excuse me. And Alan said, yes. And she said, is that your plastic bag? And Alan said, yes. She goes, could I please have that? And Alan said, um, yeah, okay. And he tipped his couple of things out of it and handed her a plastic bag. She took four steps, dropped to her knees and just threw up in the bag. And it was wow. the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. And then the bag had holes in it, the spew oh. rolling down the bloody hill at Lords. I'm like, this is just too many things. I'm not really sure what's happening. So it was an interesting day. What was the question? Yeah, that was that was the question. That, that was good. Was, was it? Enough. Yeah. 
What a um, day. Sorry. It took a day to answer that, and I'm sorry. No, no, it was a great answer. Then I want to ask another question. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> so as a post-match interviewer, at, at this stage in your career, you're already so practiced at it, do you kind of just do it off the fly or do you have pre-prepared questions that you're sort of going to roll with? And then did you have to, obviously, after the 50 overs, it looked like we were going to win and you sort of had a bunch of questions prepared and then you had to sit down again and go through it all again. Is that how, how it plays out for you or do you just get out there and just based on what you've seen and then you just go? Um, I think probably uh, earlier on in my career, I was so nervous, um, certainly about how people felt about my knowledge of the game, um, that everything was probably a little bit more prepared than it is now. Now I feel very comfortable that I can watch the game, I can absorb myself, you know, become absorbed in the game and go, okay, right, so I really need to ask you what happened there or, you know. So I, I probably had a... Um, I had, nothing, I had nothing when I walked on the field. I had no idea what I was going to ask anyone. It was all about just sort of gauging things. You know, with Jimmy being emotional, you sort of have to you have to ask things differently. I think I just gave him a hug first. You know, like you kind of, and I'm lucky. I'm in a very privileged position because I know these um, players because of, you know, Guppy and I spent a lot of time with them and, and had spent a lot of time in um, the six weeks build up. So I was in a really privileged position that I felt that, that um, I'd be okay to not have anything super prepared because nothing could prepare anyone for what happened that day. Um, so I think, yeah, no, I no, I don't, I don't, again, I've forgotten the question, but no, I don't generally have too much prepared until I'm at the game. You know, I like to talk about moments and thing, you know, things that have happened during the course of the, the match as opposed to going with my pre-prepared questions. It, it's obviously a double downer when things don't go well, but what about take you back to the 2015 yeah. Cricket World Cup? Because things did go very well for, for Guppy, the uh, highest run score in the tournament. And you're there, obviously, working for Sky. Like, when he hits a ton and you've nailed your, your sort of comms job or your, your yeah. hosting or your broadcasting or whatever, like, is that a really special? Are you guys like, yeah. like we fucking nailed it today? Yeah, <laughs> what a couple. <laughs> Um, it's funny. There's only one time I reckon we've ever sat, sat down together after a game and gone, quiet, man, I was good today. Like, I don't think that that's really ever happened that much. And that was the one time after um, Guppy got 180 against South Africa and Hamilton. Um, and I was newly pregnant and I felt like smack baby's ass. And I was not sure I was going to be able to just sort of do my job that well that day. He had some hamstring issues and wasn't sure he was going to be able to do his. And we got in the car to drive back to Auckland. And I was like, damn, we had a good day. <laughs> um, and we really did. Um, I didn't throw up and you got all those runs. It was great. You won. Um, the, the, the 2015 World Cup was a completely different experience. Um, of being at home was just awesome. And everyone got the fever. It was like finally a lot of my friends who were like, oh, this cricket thing is a real drag. And now they were like, oh, my God, I love cricket. I'm like, I know. I told you. I've been telling you for years. Um, <laughs> and obviously Guppy doing so well. Guppy is incredibly, um, he's, he's amazing the way he can he can keep very even through the good and the bad. And I and I think that that's really um, what makes him so good. And people maybe not don't realise that, but he is very good at staying completely even through the good and the bad, and I think that that, that helps me, not all the time, though, because I'm not the most hinged person I've ever met um, when it comes to uh, watching sport, but um, he is he's amazing. So it was it was really cool. The final was completely different because you could you could accept losing that because you had your, your asses handed to you. That mm. was a – this, you know, we didn't deserve to win that. There's no two ways about it. We just didn't play well enough. 2019, very different. Very, very, very different. I promise this whole podcast isn't going to be about your relationship. Hey, look, if it was, it would, <laughs> Guppy won't listen, but um, it'll be, it'll be, I, I won't be mad. <laughs> but I do have one more question. Okay. Um, so we're going to get into your, your work history and, and sort of uh, your path. I understand it went something like this. Push play, mm. cricket show, second interview was with Martin Guptill, the man you married. How good was that? How good was that interview? Yeah, you must have well, known it. Well, see, um, yeah, no, obviously I was very good. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> it was, <laughs> um, yeah, push play was a doozy. Um, yeah, so the cricket, yeah, so yeah, my second interview was with Guppy. Um, he's just, you. I mean, he is a, he is a really, 
great human being and you only have to talk to him for about five minutes to figure that out um he's just got a lovely way about him and he made me very uneasy when i first met him like not many people i don't get phased by a lot of stuff um just through i guess nature of what i've done and um in my career um and i wasn't scared of interviewing players or you know coming up against anyone that i you know was going to have to ask questions of but um he just made me a bit like oh Okay, good. <laughs> and I'm not, that's, so he sort of came into the green room at Sky and this is my, you know, like I say, second cricket show and I've the second live television experience ever and, and I'd somehow decided I was, I was going to get myself into this really weird routine where I was going to have a, a can of V, I mean I was 19, a can of V and then brush my teeth and then go and do my thing and um, I don't know why, I don't know why that was a thing, uh, it was super weird. Um, my teeth thanked me for it because you don't want to leave that V just sitting in there, I don't think. But um, so he came into the green room and I had my V and I sort of got a bit flustered and sort of, and I said, do, do you want to sit? And he, he was like, no. And I was like, ah, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to go and brush my teeth. <laughs> it was so, and I, even now I'm like, I cannot believe Got ya. <laughs> um, no, I mean, and, and three years later. Um, yeah, so that was there. I don't even remember what I really asked, to be honest. I had a producer who was um, quite into sort of throwing things out there. Randomly, like, Laura, just check what's on the screen there and ask him about it. And he put on this pair of, um, so Guppy's missing toes on one of his, he had an accident when he was younger and he's missing three of his toes. And the 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 producer put up a, a pair of socks that were like gloves for your toes. And I was like, <laughs> I don't, I can't ask him. I'm not going to ask that. I'm not going to think it was Mark, Mark Richardson in the end to ask him. And I, I, I remember just going, I, I just wouldn't, I just wouldn't, uh, that's just not, that's just not what I'm going to. So that, so yeah, I don't know whether it was that that got him across the line or the V, I, I don't know. Did you have a V before the ball that guy have out? Yes, but it was laced with a couple of things, I think. Like a bit of <laughs> <and>, uh, <laughs> I don't think it was just a straight V. I, I might have been, been my vodka rebel days where you're like one away from having a heart attack, you know? Let's let's go right, let's go back to Christchurch um, and growing up. Now, you've spoken really passionately about your love of cricket and sport, but I understand that probably wasn't your first love. Acting, you got an acting bug quite early. And according to Guy, you were the lead in almost every school performance through that period of Christchurch high school history if only that would translate into real life um <laughs> yes no I uh I loved acting um and I studied performing arts when I left school um I always wanted to be an actress um clearly I wasn't very good because it hasn't really sort of gone that well but um uh yeah so oh god bless him um yeah okay yeah at school at high school um it wasn't just sport sport was in my family's blood because of my mum's job my mum's a player agent um and she was looked after most of the uh, actually the um, crusaders she had like the justin marshalls and andrew mertens leon mcdonald and then in cricket that sort of golden era for canterbury cricket she looked after a, a large portion of those players so we were always sort of around them they were always um at our house i had this amazingly bizarre upbringing where we had these extraordinary people just in our home all of the time which was really cool i'm very very lucky did you grasp that um, as a as a, as a kid it? growing up did you did you grasp absolutely not that, that these were these were new zealand's kind of superheroes or they were just people that worked with your mum just people that worked with my mum and my mum is like and i'm not just saying this because my mum's very good at her job and so she's and 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 mum is a like a, a nurturer first so anything she did she would always involve the families and so the partners and and I don't think that that was sort of there before mum came along just purely for the fact that there wasn't really agents until mum started doing what she did and um, I'll never forget one of the players she looked after his wife said to me you know your mum just changed everything for us because she was asking questions of the player but basing it on family first and is this the right thing for your family and and, and that that just hadn't been questions that had been asked before um so um family meant that they came around and hung out with us as a family and that, that just was the way it was and um you know I remember very distinctly this one game of cricket at Jade Stadium um when I say sport was in my blood my dad ran what was Jade Stadium 
um, back in the day as well. So we would go to the games, whether it was through dad's work or mum's work, my um, family holidays, we would go to the base reserve for the Boxing Day test matches. I remember watching Matthew Sinclair get his 200 against the West Indies. Um, weird. Like, this is my childhood. Um, and uh, I remember the, the day after a, a one day or against India, the Black Caps won. Chris Cairns got 115 not out. He got dropped a couple of times, I think. And I remember going to the game and watching it. And then the next day he came round. Um, and it, like, it was cool. You know, I was so young. Cool, you got some runs. You know, good for you. I don't even think I said anything. But my nana was there with us the next day. And nana said, um, that was pretty good. And he said, did you want me to sign something so you could take it to the club. Now, my nana was the vice president of the Kaipoi Working Men's Club. And he just sort of said this super willy-nilly. And and she was like, yeah, that'd be great. And they sort of raffled it off and the club made some money. And like, it was just like, Chris Keynes once turned up to our house dressed as the Easter Bunny um, for Easter. And we just thought that was very normal. Um, so we were incredibly, incredibly lucky. Is New Zealand such a small pool that once you establish yourself, like your mum did, as a very good player agent, I mean, you've named some, some some of the biggest names in New Zealand sport there. Is it just word of mouth that she does this incredible job, you've got to come, and then, like, what did she have a big client to start with that then filtered down to basically take over the rest of the sporting New Zealand landscape? I... I, I think probably word of mouth, and there's a lot of there's a lot of agents now in the game who are very very good as well. But Mum was sort of the first of who kind of certainly the first female. She's she's a bit of a badass my Mum. I think she's pretty rad. She's pretty amazing. <laughs> um, she's um, someone I massively massively look up to. Um, she yeah, I think a lot of it would have been word of mouth. And Canterbury is you know that was such a, a, a golden era. The Craig Mullins, Nathan Astle, all of those boys. You know that was such a golden era um once one you know i think once this becomes easy and and it was actually martin crow that um, helped mum first start and um because my parents used to have budget rent a car budget rent a car were the main sponsors of the i think it was the young guns even then um so she met them and things just evolved and i don't know you have to you'll, you'll have to interview her one day she's got a great I story to. yeah she is, to. she is she's totally bored she's really good <laughs> I forgot what I was going to ask. I had another. I had another. I had a follow-up question about um, about that. I'm not even thing. answering the questions properly. I'm so no. sorry. Well, actually, it's it's more about storytelling than actually asking and answering questions. It's just kind of getting an insight. God, I better go and get a V. Like that. That's what <laughs> I was going. That's what I was going to um to bring up is that we've spoken about these athletes that were in and around your home, and I referenced Jason Gunn as the MC of your wedding earlier on. But there's people like that that you were in and around as well. I think the late Philip Leishman is your godfather? Yeah, he is. So he and um, my dad went to school together. He and Mark and my dad um, are from Timaru. And, uh, yeah, they, they all grew up together. So we were – my parents are just magnificent people. And, and yeah, so we were so lucky um, with who we spent time with and um, who was at our house. My um, parents were involved in the variety – uh, club, which is a, a charity organisation, my dad was really heavily involved, and in, so you met more more amazing people through that. You know, Yolanda Cocrofts, Ali Moore is still a really great friend of my mum's, and I just feel like I'm name dropping now. Um, That's okay. But, um, but yeah, no, my parents are uh, amazing, and and we were very very lucky with uh, the people that we got to spend time with, and still get to spend time with. I th and I think that paints a picture and a better understanding of kind of. I guess how you how you've evolved as a person, but what I do find interesting is that you've got these um, personalities coming through the home, but it's only you that's gravitated towards more of a, a higher profile career. Your two brothers are, with respect, probably a little bit in the background. Your dad as well, obviously worked and ran Jade Stadium, but you've sort of gravitated towards it. What was? Why do you think that might have been? Um, I think that the broadcasting that I have done is probably an extension of the performing arts that I wanted to do. Um, I do a lot of emceeing now, and that's the closest thing I get to the theatre, and the theatre was always my favourite, favourite um, art form, if you call it, because um, I get a live audience, and it's really cool, it's really immediate, um, and you know if your jokes have worked or not. So um, I I don't, I don't, uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't know how that sort of, yeah, I do think it's an extension of of my acting because I'm playing the 
broadcasting version of Laura and I'm playing the the MC version, the radio version, even though it's all me, you know, you just take on a slightly different persona for each one. But um yeah, I don't I don't I don't know why the boys didn't well they're very, very good public speakers, uh, actually, ironically, both my brother and my dad. Uh, we're a very loud family. Things get very loud. There's <laughs> a lot of storytelling and joke telling and yeah, poor old Guppy's not a <laughs> not a particularly loud bloke. My God, it's like <laughs> baptism of fire when he first came to a McGoldrick do. But um, yeah, no, uh, I, I I don't really know how that came to be. And my mum, bless her, she's very very doesn't like like she'll be mortified. I've said any of this stuff because she likes to very much be at the the um, sort of quietly quietly. She's very happy just to do a job. She doesn't. You'll 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 not find many photos or you won't find any interviews with her. She yeah. just doesn't. It's just not. It's not in her nature. She's not showy. I must have got. I must have got her there. Aren't I lucky? Aren't you lucky? Actually, some us. <laughs> she might be quite hard to pin down for between two beers. Then mm, mm, the she might. She might be busy or babysitting or yeah, something. But before we before we leave acting though, when I mean, you have got acting chops, West Side you are in. How much truth to the Shortland Street? Oh, I was in Shortland Street, but I was only in for a couple of episodes. It wasn't. Um, it was pretty undramatic. I was a girl that Hunter. Uh, liked uh, at um, medical school and I know what you're thinking look at her of course she's been to medical school and like I mean I pulled it off <laughs> with a blom. Um yeah no I don't know how that uh, yeah Shorten Street it's good fun it's a, it was a hell of a place to learn because there's so many cameras and it's so fast paced and it was sort of like my first sort of television gig it like that and then I was like wait I think I can do it again I think I should do it again they're like no no gotta move on gotta move on and you're like oh. <laughs> I'm done. Okay, great. There, there was a, one other entry in your um, IMDb page, which was an appearance I have an IMDb on the page. Yeah, oh, yeah, I do. Uh, the Late Show with Stephen Colbert when he oh, yeah. came out to New Zealand, and I think you did a segment with, um, with DJ Forbes and Pity Whippu. Um, yes. Did you spend a day with him? What was your recollection yes. of, of Stephen? The whole thing was just absolutely wild. So it was um, it was part of this New Zealand tourism campaign. Um, Jacinda had invited him out. Um, I don't know why I'm talking about her like on a first name basis. I see her every day on my television, so I just feel like it's okay to do that. The prime yeah. minister had invited them out when she went on the late show. He came out and um, yeah, so we were we were going to teach him how to rugby. That was the the premise for the segment. He was being kiwified while he was here. Uh, and so we went down to Wanaka uh, and we went to a beautiful rugby club there. And I remember we had to get up super early and it was me, Pity, DJ. I think it was just, it was just yeah, it was just us. And um, a couple of pe other people that were driving us and stuff. And I was doing my makeup in the middle of the two of them because I'm not, I'm not a, it, bizarrely, even though I've done a lot of briefers, I'm not a morning person. Like I'm just not good at moving quickly. So I'm like in the car, I've got the, <laughs> and he's like, would it be good, helpful if I bumped your elbow? And I was like, God damn. <laughs> um, this, is, this is my chance to make it in America. You know, I'm leaving you all behind. Um, and um, so we arrived and then we went into the club rooms and everyone just sort of sat down and just waited until um, Stephen Colby uh, was to arrive. And then his posse was friggin' massive. He brought a camera crew over. I reckon there was... 120 people. I mean, bearing in mind this is going to be a four minute segment, if that. Probably 120 people. There was wardrobe. I mean, the man wears a suit. Wardrobe, um, my hair and makeup. Have you seen what he looks like? Hair and makeup. Um, didn't touch me. I wasn't allowed to get my hair and makeup. I had to do it myself. Um, uh, what else did they have? So they had a, um, a, a DOP, they had the camera crew, they had soundies, lighting, all of these people they had bought, um, catering I think they managed to hire in, in New Zealand, which was great. Um, unfortunately, I was like, I just couldn't eat for that. Do you want a white bat patty? No, I personally, I mean, I love a white bat patty, but I'm not going to breathe white bat patty all over this bloke. I'm trying <laughs> to get him to take me back to America with him. So I'm just going to like woe back on the white bat patty, but thank you so much. Um so we waited and then we were told someone stood up in front of us and said, everyone must exit the uh, club rooms because Mr. Colby is about to arrive. No, and it was I like, didn't. and I'm like, hey, and you, <laughs> and like, because they had some local, um, some of the local rugby teams come out because they were, we were going to use them to teach them how to do a line out and what have you. And everyone was like, what? 
what do you mean? They're like, no, we're going to, you need to get out. Um, the, you know, um, Mr. Colbert is on his way. So we're just going to get everyone to um, move out of the club rooms and uh, you can come back in just a minute. If there's anything you need to grab, take it with you because you can't come back uh, until Stephen is ready to go. And everyone's like- Really good accent, by the way. Really good accent. <laughs> drama school paid divvies for just a smidge um it was kind of like uh right and then i forgot my phone and a lip gloss because you know god forbid i didn't have a lip gloss and um i sort of like snuck back in <laughs> i thought i was gonna get in trouble um we all had to stand outside it was bloody freezing and um and everyone was just sort of waiting he arrives there were three mini buses that arrived he was in the middle one i don't know he had all the security he had all this very shiny sort of suit and shoes on and i was like you're gonna get so dirty <laughs> <So> <laughs> Thinking to myself, and then we were allowed back in the club rooms, and then we started. And he was like, he was very lovely. Um, he had a he had a guy that ran the script, so he would um, he would have notes. We finished, and he was lovely. Got selfies. I mean, God, if you didn't get a selfie, did it really happen? He was very lovely in that regard, and 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 all of this sort of stuff. And all of the producers that came out were all so lovely, and everyone finished, and we had to drive straight to the airport. And we drive to the airport, and bizarrely after all these goodbyes and thank you and it was so great to meet you oh my god you guys are wonderful it's gonna be hilarious don't worry about it um we arrive at the airport at the exact same time and he took a chopper and we drove and um we go into the um Kori lounge and they have put with this like blue velvet rope around one couch and a table covered in cheese this little area which is right beside where we are sitting so he is he is as close to me as my, as my kitchen sink is there, and and it was sort of like, are we supposed to just not talk to him? I don't know. We've just spent all day with him, and we just everyone. Pity was like, are we supposed to? Um, should we move? And I was like, now it's too obvious. Like we can't move, and we're all just sitting here, and people weren't allowed to go over to him. It, you know, oh. but the funniest thing was, is it was very obvious with the uh, the bollards and the velvet thing this bloke i heard come into the coral lounge he goes the bloody hell's that guy doing and like no one really knew who he was because if you don't follow late night american television you're not gonna know who he is but it was just i honestly it was hilarious it was like something out of a movie really it was very unkiwi but i loved it so good i love um we can just probe away i had no idea that story was coming but that... <laughs> oh sorry no i know no, you're jealous so good. Good. Yeah. um before, like, okay, obviously not that starstruck with Stephen Colbert, let's say. Um, slightly different the footage I saw of you meeting Meghan Markle. Yeah, you know, that is embarrassing. Um, <laughs> I'm a massive royalist. Like, it's um, just so, I have such great, very vivid memories of my mum, my nana and I watching, you know, Diana's, the, the, when Lady Diana, when Princess Diana died, that was my first where was I moment. When where I were thought, you? you know, I was at my Auntie Teresa's house and Uncle Warner, and we heard it on the radio and it, she hadn't died at that point, but um, um, Dodi Al-Fayed had. And 23 Kotari Street, Topol, if you're wondering. I was you on what? the driveway of, I was at 23 Kotari Street in Topol on the driveway of Malcolm Menzies' house when I heard. There you and go. Like, how did you hear? Over the radio? I think my mum came and told me. I remember my mum just being devastated. Like, yeah, it's, it's, like it was just devastation. And I was devastated because I loved looking at the pictures that mum and her magazines and her woman's day had. And I just, and Nana, and we had the tea towels and the cups. And oh my God, I have a cup. I have a Charles and it's up, like it's too high. I need guppy or a ladder, but I have a, because no one can touch it. I'm saving it for when like really posh people come. And it's yeah. it's actually probably a bit cursed because it's um Diana and Charles marriage cup. But anyway, we've got the China. Um, it's so... I loved William and Harry, always sort of maybe secretly thought, God, I hope they like cricket and mum can find a way for me to meet them and maybe marry one of them. I would be a great princess. Um, and um, that didn't obviously transpire. But, um, yeah, at that stage, Megan hadn't turned into whatever the hell she's turned into now. She was like, oh, this is awesome. Like, the for the royal family to keep going, they need someone who's a little bit different to what they currently have got going on in the royal family. She's going to be a breath of fresh air. She's going to. She is not. That was. She was all of the things that I she thought she would. She just was very disappointing. But so yeah, I lost my completely lost my. There was no. I was embarrassing. I was super embarrassing meeting her. Like that I was think my favorite. My favorite part of that clip though was you saying, Jacinda and I have both had babies. 
No, it made it sound like we were a couple and we had just had a child together because Jacinda had come again. There I go, great mate. No, I don't, I don't. Um, we, she, I had interviewed her through work at the Herald and and had done this thing about you know women in power and interview with her. So I had like quite an in depth conversation with her and we talked about having babies and stuff. And so like I was like, cool, and fine. She comes past and she's walking with them. So I've waited for like two hours at the viaduct to see. The, ironically, I only really wanted to see Harry just to sort of say, hey, look, I love a ginger. Get rid of her. <laughs> I'm all yours. Um, no, but I never saw him. I was so flabbergasted at seeing her. I just about shat myself. Like I was not cool. Anyway, so um, Jacinda comes down first and she goes, oh my God, Laura, what are you doing here? And I was like, I, what is it? What do you mean? What am I doing here? I'm here to meet Harry and Megan and be their friend. I don't know. What... <laughs> and she's like, would you like me to take a photo? And I was like, it's a friggin' lonely. I want you to take a photo. This is the most bizarre day of my life. Please take my phone. And um, I, you know, I just had a kid. So there's a lot of photos of my baby in there. Um, here's my phone. And if you could take a photo, that'd be great. And she came, Megan comes along first. I don't even know where Harry was. And the girl, uh, Juliet, who I was with, is one of my producers in radio, had a bunch of flowers and she'd gone to great lengths to get wedding flowers and stuff. I hadn't done any of that. I was just there. Um, and she was talking through the flowers with Megan and Jacinda goes, Megan, would you just turn around your Duchess or whatever she was at that point, would you just turn around and I'll just get a photo with you? And she goes, do, uh, oh, do you guys, is this? And I was like, oh, we just, we just had a baby. And then <laughs> it just sort of fell out. And then Jacinda, like with this look of sheer shock, goes, we didn't just have a baby. And I was like, no, look. <laughs> No, so, and then I start getting really high pitched and a bit squeaky and you can see all the veins in my neck and I can't breathe and I go all red and people are staring because I'm declaring that I've had a child with the Prime Minister and I just want Megan to be my friend and I, she's just announced she's having, it was, I was the most uncool version of myself I have ever been. Like even worse than the V situation with Gubby. Like not joke. It was so mortifying. And what was more mortifying is that it's on video and people have seen it and people will continue to watch it because it will haunt me for the rest of my life because I criticize Megan more than I care to tell you. <laughs> so everyone's like, yeah, but you lost your call when you met her. Totally did. Totally did. Yeah, we'll we'll link it in the uh, show notes. <laughs> Please don't. I'd rather you linked in the Guppy interview. <laughs> Is that, can we find that? I, I, was, I was looking for that. Yeah, so couldn't get I it anyway. copies. It was back in the day when it was all on, on film. I just, <laughs> but, yeah. um, let's work through your, your work career. You, you, we sort of spoke about you wanting to be an actress, um, but then you sort of found your feet on the cricket show and you were amazing with your cricket knowledge and your, your broadcast talent. Did you realise during the cricket show that you were actually very good at this and you saw a future? And then did you think that like where you are today was somewhere where you could get to in those early days? No, I really didn't. I didn't know I was any good at all. I'd always watched the game with great in intent um, because my brothers played. My brothers were very good um, and I loved watching them. I'd do some scoring every now and again. Um, I loved I loved the, I love everything that cricket stands for. I love everything it represents. I love that I would go to watch my brother play club cricket and everyone knows your name and you high five and you bring some morning tea or some afternoon tea and then you do a bit of scoring and you have a chat and then you have a beer after the game. Like I just you know I like just the whole thing. I've always been a it's always been a big part of my life. Obviously going to the games as well with mum and dad and then my brother's a huge um, question askers so they would talk to the to a lot of the players that we would have at our house and we would hear these stories and I would get more and more invested and understand more and more about the game um, I probably remember really strange things like when Chris Harris was playing a test match in India and he took his helmet off and shunned it like I remember stuff like that and maybe not always the stats that my brothers did but I would remember that so we worked together and turns out I have this really bizarre cricketing um, knowledge. Um, I didn't know I had the knowledge until I had sort of was forced to use it, um, which was cool, which was exciting. It was like a little thing that surprised a lot of people. I did feel pressure, though, to prove to a lot of people that I did know my stuff and I did know enough about the game to be talking about it. But I never, I've never declared or or said that I'm an expert in it. I just love the game, and so that will always be the basis of all my questions being asked because I love the game. I want to know. X, Y, Z. It's not because I'm better than you are. Um, it's because, or I think I know better than you do. It's just because I love the game and I want to know more about it. So I think that 
um, that was a nice point of difference for me at that point in time um, that I just wanted to learn more about the game. And I still want to learn more about it. I ask Guppy a lot about the game. Um, I'm not scared to ask his teammates. Um, so, um, no, I didn't realise that this would ever be something that I could eventually do. I thought it was, to be honest, when it first started, I was like, oh, this is, a good this is just a good opportunity. I'll just take this opportunity. Um, I had to audition for it. I interviewed Shane Bond on Push Play. And I sounded apparently quite knowledgeable. I don't remember what we talked about. I sounded quite knowledgeable um, about the game, apparently. And uh, producer at Sky rang um, Shane and said, could I, and, uh, could I talk to the person who interviewed you? She seemed to know her stuff. And he said, it's actually my agent's daughter. Would you like um, my agent's phone number? And so I went and auditioned. And I'd never used an auto cue. I'd never used an earpiece. I didn't know anything about live television. Everything I did, did on Push Play was sort of, pre-recorded and you know it was all very I don't know it was for kids so you you talk differently I suppose to kids and you do the adults I'm not sure um so I never envisaged that this would be a pathway I went down but once I got a taste I wanted more and I wanted to I realized that this was something that I could actually do I loved it I loved working on live sport I loved talking about cricket I with people that you know obviously played the game or um, you know, even like comedians like Ben Hurley used to come on the cricket show with me a lot and I just really enjoyed the banter with him and I love this and I was like, can this really be a job? Like, could this be something I could do? My God. And then um, I was like, okay, well, if, if this is what TV's like, this is like, what's radio like? I've always been interested in that. And so I went to Radio Live, um, what was Radio Live back then and I was doing outrageously bizarre hours and late nights, early morning, whatever I could do, whatever people needed, because I hadn't gone to broadcasting school, I needed to learn and I was prepared to do whatever it took. So um, one day someone was sick and I read the news for them and then I just started getting more gigs like that. So everything's just sort of evolved. I've been very lucky that when the opportunities have presented themselves, I've been ready or maybe not been ready, but I've backed myself enough to have a good crack at it and um, things have eventuated. And I've been so lucky. I've worked with some incredible people um, along the way I, I just never could have seen it going this way but I like to work hard and I like to prove people wrong and I like I don't know I just love my I love my job I'm very very lucky you and, and you're very good at it can I just say you, you oh that's great right. well you Absolutely. have to say that because we're no, 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 uh, I'm slapping people off on there all the time yeah. <laughs> um but as at Sky as you're working your way I mean you're you, you get the biggest gigs in the game now like you're hosting the Olympics coverage is pretty much as big as it gets I imagine but on your way up when you're getting these bigger and bigger gigs and they're live gigs was, it, was there any moments when you were really shitting yourself thinking holy shit i've got the whole country here watching me sort of thing and were there any moments of real nerves without sounding like a dickhead no because i i am always as prepared as i can be when i go to do it i don't leave any room for error. So I know exactly, even though I might have a script in front of me, I know it off by heart. I know where I'm going next. I know what I've got to throw to. I know if someone's not going to turn up or someone passes out midway through, I know what I'm going to say. I know where I'm going to get it. So my, I love that my job is steering the ship. Um, I'm not Kane Williamson, and I did not mean to make it sound like I have anything to do with that. But that is just, that is, as the anchor, as the broadcaster, that's my role. And I love that. And I love the feeling of it live. And it's funny, you know, when I, if I go back to the question you asked about when Guff and I have good days, it's it always makes me laugh because I don't really talk about my job a lot to a lot of people. It's easier to talk about Gabby's jobs because it's easier to see when it's gone well for him. But for me, he'll be doing his warm-ups behind me and I'm steering the ship that is the first half an hour of an ODI. And I've got counts, I've got people counting in my ear and I've got to get to here and we've got to get to world pictures and I've got to hit my numbers. And when I get them on the inside, I'm like, yeah, yeah, you are. <laughs> but no one would know that. Everyone, you know, the ups out there doing this thing, you know. Yeah. Crushed it, crushed it over here. <laughs> I don't need anyone else to know that. I know that, but um, I love that. I, I find that really thrilling. And every time I get it right, it just makes me want to get it right more and more and more, you know. So, um, so no, I don't, I don't get nervous. There was probably a couple of times uh, early on that I did certainly get nervous. There was one occasion where uh, my godfather, I think, did the last Cricket Awards, the New Zealand Cricket Awards, and then I took over, or there might have been one year that Eric Young did it, and then I took over and have done it ever since. Um, touch what I keep doing. And, um, uh, and that was the only time I was a little bit nervous. I was like, well, I don't, I don't want to be compared to my 
my fill. Like I just, but and, and not that you could compare two completely different broadcasters, but um, I was really lucky that I had Phil um, when I first started. Like he was super proud that I sort of had gone down this broadcasting route that he'd done and done so well. And and I remember like just picking his brains constantly, the poor guy, about um, being in broadcasting, what it was like, and what I need to do, and how I'd be better. And really annoying and um he just said to me you just need to remember that it's a real privilege to be invited into somebody's living room even if they're just watching dinner and you're on in the background it is a privilege to be invited into somebody's living room and I've always told myself that and that's you know I, I want to do the best because I, I I love that I'm in I'm just hanging out with someone as they're getting ready to have their tucker and a beer and watch the cricket or watch the Hellberg Awards or whatever it is and I so I'm always very very aware of how lucky I am to to do what I do. I caught a glimpse during the Olympic coverage of a moment which I can imagine is probably the hardest thing a broadcaster has to do. It was a live coverage. Um, it was Goran doing, uh, he was waiting to throw to the David Nika fight and for whatever reason it was delayed. So he was hosting it by himself. He was waiting to throw and it, like the minutes seemed to go forever. It was like three four five minutes and he did a really good job like treading water you could tell that he didn't have a lot to use there was like these instagram posts that kept coming up and he kept going back to them but i was thinking that poor guy that must be the hardest thing ever by yourself on the spot trying to think of new stuff to say not knowing when you're actually going to be able to throw to the live feed can i jump in did you have to do that for the valerie adams gold medal ceremony back in Auckland? That's so long. So is this, you talking about the ANZ one? Yeah. So there was, there, when Dame Valerie came second to obstetric and then she tested positive and they took the gold off her and gave it to Valerie, we had a remeddling ceremony that ANZ were the um, main sponsor and host of and they had it at the cloud. And my job was to do the television coverage. John Hawksby was doing the inside the, the cloud coverage of, of, of Dame Valerie accepting her award. And it, I don't know what happened, but there was just zero communication. Like there was no, I had I had no idea how long I had to tread water until I had to throw and neither did anyone else. It just, sometimes that happens. And I had no earpiece, but I just kept going, I think, I think <laughs> we, we're just moments away. So I'm gonna stay with us. Let's just have a wee, my favorite moments of the, and I reckon I was there for a good 12 minutes and I still, with um, Sue, who is one of the wonderful women who uh, works at ANZ, we still laugh about that. Well, if worse comes to worse, I'll just put a finger in my ear and pretend <laughs> someone is talking to me. Like, because it was a, it was a nightmare. Great fun, great stories, great. Now, at the time, absolutely cacking myself because I was like, I, 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 I've said so many different numbers. I'm not sure where we are now. I don't know. And it was fireworks and oh my God. But it was um, a wild success. And Dame Valerie got her <laughs> medal, so that was all that mattered. But like 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 that Goran example is that when the when it finally happens and the cameras cut away, is it like a what the fuck just happened there at the moment? Like, are you are you breaking character and going? Well, someone fucking saw this out. What the fuck? Well, there's not much you can do when it comes to the Olympics because there's obviously a lot of moving parts and with COVID particularly. Um, there were so many protocols and stuff that the athletes had to go through before they were allowed to either start their event or um, get to their medal ceremony. So there's only so many times you can go over it. But, yeah, you. I mean, I certainly had – I think there was one I had where I cried all the time. Like, the Olympics, what a nightmare I am. I'm a very emotional sports watcher. And I think it's because I've had children as well, and I see it firsthand – um, when it goes good, when it goes bad, the work that goes in behind the scenes. So I have this real empathy with athletes because I, I you know, you, I get to see, um, and again, another privileged position where I get to see um, the hard work and whether it goes well or doesn't, it's like heartbreaking if it doesn't. But, you know, if it does, you're like, oh, God, all the pain, suffering, parents driving them to care up here, oh, my God, you know, like, oh, terrible. Um, so I was a nightmare. So there was literally times where it would just be me on screen going like this, um, just a second. I'm just gonna. Woo! That Dame Val. Oh, two kids. Okay, she hasn't seen them in months. No, I'm good. Wow. Wow. Good. That's good. That's good for our daughters to see that. You know, like. And there's definitely a face after you come up and you go, "What the hell did I just say?" There's the occasion that you go, "I'm not sure for the last nine minutes what I have just talked about." But everyone's like, "No, it sounded all right." And you go, "Oh, thank God." Oh God. Um, 
but yeah, no, you do have the odd. I think Goran, yeah, Goran was sensational. But again, that's just being super prepared and knowing all your, um, you know, having notes and knowing all the athletes, and that's where all the legwork that you put in before the tournament or the you know starts that you you can draw on, and then you can also talk about it from you know as a sports fan what you loved about it or or what like with Dame Valerie it was certainly easy to talk about that because you know you look at her and you're like wow my god I couldn't even tie my own shoes six months after having my first child and she won silver at the Com games now she's won bronze up the year after the Olympics for me you know so it's, it, yeah um I don't know if you were but were you on air when Emma Twig won gold oh god <laughs> I was a mess I was an absolute mess. Yeah. yeah, I was. I was. I was very lucky to be on here for her. Um, Emma's a, a wonderful um, athlete. She's a superb athlete. And I'm very lucky. I, um, got to talk about how lucky I am. I am incredibly lucky. <laughs> um, I started working with Emma in 2012 before her second Olympic campaign with ANZ. Um, ANZ have sponsored her um, since then. ANZ and... have sponsored this whole episode. Damn it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Are they not sponsoring this? They are now. <laughs> Um, uh, and um, can you? I'll oh, just go get my polo. Hold on. <laughs> um, <laughs> they uh, so um, I was really lucky. I was working on the, on that campaign and met Emma and talked a lot to her. And you know, she was the high hopes and everyone, you know, because it was her, Hamish and Eric. You know what could possibly go wrong? And unfortunately for Emma, not much went right um, on that final race. And then I remember sort of the next, the build up to the next games and, you know, and she's like, you know, this one, this one, this one. And then I had to go on interview when she retired and she said to me um, in, in Christchurch, at Christchurch Airport just um, just before this this lockdown happened and we welcomed the first lot of the Olympians out of MIQ with our NZ. And Emma said to me, we were talking, we were just having a cup of tea and she said, she said, I was, I remember in 2000 and 15, 16, um, after Rio, watching you, me, uh, on the on the ANZ bus driving to the cloud with Blair and Pete and their medals and you taking a selfie with them. And I remember being so devastated because that should have been me. That should have been me every year since I met you for these Olympic Games that we should have had a selfie together of me with a gold medal. And today we can finally get that medal. And I was like, oh, for the love <laughs> of God. <laughs> I've got that selfie. It's really good. Yeah. I'm a little she, teary in it. She's awesome. We had her on before the Olympics, and I think mm -hmm. Stephen and I were in different places when that race was on and she won gold, but we messaged each other afterwards. It was like, man, so emotional for her having heard that story. Yeah, and that's one of the things that, that you get to experience. I mean, you've referenced it a number of times how lucky you are, but you do get the privilege of, of being close to some of these people and then sharing in that emotion by having that personal connection. It's a pretty awesome, pretty awesome thing. I could never have in my wildest dreams imagined or hoped for what I get to do and how I get to do it. And I'm a, I'm a chatter by nature, so I'm lucky if those who want to talk to me, I'm like all ears. And I, I just love hearing other people's stories of how they became these inspirations. And Emma is, I mean, I just can't think of a better role model for Kiwi kids, even adults. You know, at first you don't succeed, which you get your ass up and you keep going until you win that gold medal if that's what you really want. And she is just, she just is living proof that that is a thing that you can do. And I just think that's so badass. Fantastic. Moving over into, back into Radio Land, um, we are big fans of the Matt and Jerry show and the ACC. We're part of the ACC now. Um, but we were also big fans of the Matt, Jerry and Laura show. Finally, oh. someone. Oh. How did that come about? How was there an audition process for that job, or who? I that? was you working. Oh, was it what? You were already holding court. Were you, were you Devlin before that? Yeah. So actually, the boys needed my go. Oh, actually, no, I've never been in a position where I've gone. Yeah, we should have them. Um, no, I was uh, um, at MediaWorks, and I was um, reading the news for um, JJ, Mike, and Dom, uh, and. Someone came over from Indian Me and said, "Would you come over and do Hodaki with um, Martin Devlin?" And so I did. I came and I was sort of his co-host and news reader there. And then Devlin moved to Radio Sport, and um, Matt and Jerry um, they were just sort of thrown in there. No, no, they weren't. No, <laughs> um, there was a process where I think we went. We did one audition, and it was 
I, was, I think it got really rude real quick and everyone was like, it's quite funny. <laughs> so um, they are just the loveliest lads. I loved working with them. They were such great fun. Yeah. They, were, they were really sensational, yeah. I imagine you've got a lot of stories. One of them we wanted to try to get out of you was it seems like there was a lot of things back then that wouldn't fly these days. Mm. Like the, um, what do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> what was the um the no sleep till breakfast one? Was it? Was it just I think like... that was the catalyst for me actually leaving. But um no no sleep till breakfast was a I I can't it was a, it was a mat and I remember to, I remember <laughs> I've never been so good in the old post-show meetings it's sort of <laughs> not off a bit um and the boys would sort of get on their tangents and, and come up with these great plans and I'd think to myself my god how am I going to get away with this and um this one they came up with um and it was the idea that they would not sleep from breakfast show to breakfast show so they'd power through <laughs> uh, I was supposed to be powering through as well any means necessary um to get through to that next um breakfast show and um I flaked we, we, we had one day where we, I think I think we might have done it. No, we only did it once. I only did it once with them. I, I, I had a drink with them during the second one. Um, the first, we went to Waiheke for lunch, and then the boys took me to a strip club. And then I had to do a cross with Mikey Havoc, who was then on Drive. And one of my proudest um, radio moments was was Mikey had asked me to sort of talk him through who um, the talent was on the on pop, pulse pulse C um, at like two o'clock on a on a on a Thursday. So that was I'm, I'm I was super glad my my grandmother wasn't listening to that show. Um, and then we went. To, I think we might have hit up a couple of strip clubs, and then we ended up at Lee Hart's house. And I left there. Um, my mum came and picked me up. And I left there, I want to say, about 11. I was like, this is, you know, it's fine. this is just... And to be fair, look, women don't necessarily get away with things like that as well as men do, you know what I mean? Like, people go, oh, she shouldn't be. She's a married woman. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was I was grateful. I went over a lot of reasons. I like sleep. Um, and anyway, so um, next morning I arrived very... I was scared. I, I, I was scared of what... I was going to see and I was scared of what was going to happen and I was scared that no one was going to turn up. Hmm. But turn up they did. Turn up they did. Matt Heath was wearing Lee Hart's wife's fur coat. (laughs) Jeremy had gone out in this beautiful, beautiful, I think this either his shoes were Prada or his suit was Prada, but he was beautiful. He was immaculately dressed. Um, as as he as he often is, and um, yeah, so Matt was wearing the fur, Jeremy was wearing the suit. I don't know if Jay Reeve had pants on. Um, <laughs> Lee was definitely there. I offered to make a cup of tea, and nobody wanted one. I do recall that, and it was one of the more interesting shows I've ever been a part of. <laughs> Yeah, I remember listening to it as it was progressing and the, the, the slurred sloppiness of Matt Heath in particular. I was like, man, they got some, they, they're able to do that. Eh? That's nice. <laughs> I mean, what a, what a, what a, when we talk about luck and privilege, the privilege was all mine to be a part of it. Yeah. Can I just say? Yeah. S- slightly different vibe when you move to the hits, I imagine. Well, it's slightly. <laughs> 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 well, it's Tony Street, and uh, yeah, no, it was slightly different. It was slightly different. Um, probably more family orientated. Um, you did the all sleep until breakfast. Yeah. All all sleep, sleep at nine, right through. Um, yeah. And the only time you were up during the night was because of your children. <laughs> it was never anything else. Um, but it's just, it was just like a natural progression um, for me, I guess, in my career and. Having kids, it was easy to talk about kids because you know what it can be like. You know, you have your <laughs> your babies, and then boy, you do talk about them a lot. And so it was easy. And and the hits is awesome. Um, and I'm very lucky to be a part of it. That's why we started the podcast so I could stop Stephen from giving me kid chat. I was zero interest. Does it really <laughs> irk you? Does it really irk you? Because I was going to send you photos, but if you don't, no, want no, to... yeah, you're cool. Look, I can deal with it. I can I... deal with it. Um. Laura, we wanted to talk to you about some of the the more difficult moments as well. Um, I understand being a woman in a sort of male-dominated field uh, comes with its challenges. Are there any 
instances that stick out or particularly tough moments you can remember, whether it be uh, on the boundary of the black caps or or sort of feedback you've been getting, which which really sort of shook you or tested you? I would be definitely lying if I said there hadn't been stuff that tested me over the years. And, and it shocks me that it still happens. Um, I still get a lot of stuff said or uh, thrown at you or um, written on social media. Um, there, there was a couple of instances that really got to me. A um, couple of times I bit back where I probably shouldn't have. A lot of occasions where I've read the comments when I shouldn't have. Um, I have developed a thicker skin now, and unfortunately that is part of my journey, and I, I now come under that, you know, umbrella of woman who had to put up with crap from men to do what she loved as a job, um, and I don't love that. Um, and it's sort of once I had a daughter became, um, I, will, I will never let them or what they say or how they treat me affect me enough to change my mood or really get on. I don't want to say get on top of me because that's some of the stuff that gets yelled out. But, um, but you know, to really affect me because, um, yeah, it, it, sh it shouldn't happen. And I, I hope to God that things start to change soon. So when my daughter decides to do it, um, or, you know, if she wants to, to go into a, a field where it's mainly males, that she doesn't have to put up with any of the crap I have. Um, I think people underestimate how hard it has been um, to get to this point in my career. I just haven't said anything. You know, you just get on with it. Uh, are there, are there any moments where, like, how do you respond when you get some bad, some someone says something truly shocking or, or you hear something in the crowd? Do you do you just sort of shut down or do you, are you confrontational? Do you go up and, and sort of pre present it's them? It probably with, depends what day you've got me on. Um, yeah. uh, the, for the longest time, I would just put my head down and keep walking. A couple of times I got older and slightly more established and more confident in what I was doing, uh, that I would turn around and go, okay, come over here and say that right to my face then. And that couldn't really, you know, it's always interesting once they think that you're not going to say anything, you know, reply. And then all of a sudden they do and they're in front of their mates and it's all very embarrassing for them. Um, but, you know, you don't really want to give it the time of day as well. Um, there's been a couple of occasions, mainly around honestly having a um, having children that has affected, not affected me, but just really ticked me off that I have said something. I remember there was this one occasion and then it was, I had my daughter in October and I was working on a one day international at Hagley Oval in Christchurch, which is my home ground. And I'm super proud of Hagley Oval. I think it's the best cricket ground in the country. And I had my baby girl there and she's, you know, six weeks old and, um, walking around the boundary. I'd just done my first cross. I'm like, yeah, girl, like, you, you, you got your baby in the pavilion with your mum. You're about to go and breastfeed it. You just <laughs> smoked that there. You had a C-section. You're in absolute agony, but here we are. And I had this, like, moment where I was like, yeah, girl, yeah. And then as I walked around, someone yelled out to me, did you have the baby or did you eat the baby? Oh, and, fucking um, hell. That was one way to have everything, you know, just sort of, and you're like, wow. You just have no idea. You just have absolutely no idea. And here I am, like walking around. You have no idea that I am in, you know, I'm, I'm hurting. There's, you know, like you just, not not emotionally, but like physically, because I do have a cesarean. Um, but I'm like, you just don't understand what it's taken for me to get to this point. And you think you're being funny by saying that. Uh, and and uh, with, there's been a couple of those. Um, when we first announced I was pregnant as well, you know, I mean, I you know, some of the comments, I mean, you can only imagine what they say. I'm a girl. I married a cricketer in the team. Mm. You know. Yeah. What, what is the strategy now? You just don't you just shut off the comments. You, do you go on social media? Or do you... Um, yeah, there's been a couple of times where I've maybe, <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. I'm like an absolute loser. Um, yeah, no, I do switch <laughs> off the comments. I don't read the comments anymore. Um, it's best not to. It's best for my blood pressure not to. I just get angry. I just get annoyed because you're like, God damn it, man. I don't come to your work and yell at you. I do not come to your work and tell you what I think of what you're wearing or come to your work and tell you who I think that you're putting where and what. I just don't do that. And I don't know why you think you have the right to do that to me. And that's probably the thing that annoys me most. And it only, I just, I, I have to switch. I have switched off. I'm better at, at, at switching off now. But, um, you know, I had a, a lovely producer who's just recently um, 
moved to TVNZ and he worked as a um, cable office guy. And he said to me, my whole, I never could understand how you could stand there and do your job with what you get yelled at you. You're standing there talking about the weather or, you know, the cricket or you're interviewing a player and there are just these grown men who probably have daughters at home yelling that stuff at you. He said, I just never realised how bad it was and I'm so sorry that that happened to you. And, and that was a really sad moment for me, that this young lad who's coming, he's, you know, he's 22 years old, he's coming through trying to work in television, he was just, you know, shocked at what was happening. And these are these are seriously grown men that think it's okay to yell that. Um, so, yeah, it's been trying. It's been It's been an interesting journey. But here we are. <laughs> and, and there's obviously levels of abuse and then there's levels of abuse, right? So you've been, there were recent reports uh, last week, you know, when the New Zealand cricket tour of um, Pakistan got, got called off and your name was linked in these reports suggesting that you got some emails sort of with, with threats. Um, is there anything you're able to say about that? Um all I can really say is that I did receive some threats and I uh, went through the proper channels um, and that was before the tour had even started and before anyone had even got on a plane um, and they were not the reason that the um, the tour was cancelled by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I think things changed pretty fast once they got over there. Um, that was that was scary. You don't like reading some of the stuff that you said. Um, I'd be lying if I said I haven't had, we had, is it? family haven't had that um in the past um oh, wow and so yeah that's uh, there's not really much else i can say that's exciting or interesting or um anything there it just it's just is what it is unfortunately having having received stuff like that are, are you are you tense whenever guppy goes away i mean i guess there's again as to, to stephen's point there's levels of places that you go but you know the world is the world now and people get to go everywhere so are you is there an element of i don't really want you to go on this tour or that's just the job and it's got to be done well that's his that's his job in new zealand cricket one of their jobs is to protect the players and and look after them and they have their processes their security processes and you know guppy felt really safe when he landed in pakistan um the pakistan cricket board and the government took really good care of them and um he felt really safe and was really excited um, to play cricket over there. I mean, how cool to be a part of that. Some of those young Pakistani boys had never played uh, a game at home and he was going to be a part of that. And we talked about that a lot as a as a couple, how cool that was. Um, but, you know, things change and you can only do what you can do with the information that you get given and that's exactly what New Zealand cricket did. So, um, and they they do a good job of looking after the players. So I we trust New Zealand cricket and... Um, that's all you can do. And then in terms in terms of your position amongst other partners of other players, are you often, are they seeking your counsel when they're new into the team and, and dealing with some of these things themselves? Are you the unofficial team captain of partners? Oh, God, of no. Partners? Um, <laughs> no, there's no, there's no unofficial team wife captain. Um, it doesn't, not that I'm aware of. Um, we are, I mean... We are, it's it's great to have um, a collective bunch of women who uh, understand exactly what's sort of, what you're going through when you spend a lot of time on your own and if you've got kids and you're doing it uh, on your own so your husband can follow their dream or your partner can follow the dream. So in that regard, we have got a, um, there's a harem of women that have a WhatsApp group and we, you know, check in with each other and stuff. But um, no, New Zealand cricket's... Um, you know, like I say, look after us and, and make sure we're in the loop. And the boys do a good job of that. And we're lucky there's, you know, your WhatsApps and Vibers and all those other things. So we're constantly in contact so we know what's going on. And, yeah, there's um, a few of us who have been around a little while now, my God. And um, and we, you know, I have some very great mates um, out of this, uh, which is cool. Beauty of the long form podcast, eh? We can just transition from strippers in the middle of the day, the death threats, the. I know. Like, yeah. Damn, <laughs> this is, we are covering ground. This is great. Um, we won't keep you too much longer. There are a few other areas I do want to touch on. Um, MCN seems like you are the go to MC. It seems like, and, and from what I've seen, you absolutely nail it. You talk about being so prepared for your sort of Sky Sports stuff. If you, a, a corporate company, reaches out, says that we want you to MC our gig. What's your process of where do you go from there? How do you how do you plan the night? How much effort do you put into what you're going to say or at this point 
is it kind of just quite easy? Bear in mind that I'm at the start of my MC journey as well, so I'm going to be taking oh. very close notes. Okay, so what you need to do straight away is you need to find out the, the, the whole sole purpose of the night. Um, I do a lot of charity um, MC events, which I love. So the purpose of the night is, is very easy. You want to make money. You want people to have a good time. Have, some of them have too much of a good time and spend more money than they might have initially thought they were going to in that night. Um, and so it's all about you know, like why you're there, um, what you need to talk about, the key messages that you need to get out. Um, and then um, people, I mean, nights out are getting rarer and rarer because of what's going on in the world. So you want to make sure that everyone's having a really, really good time. Um, and that generally is the consensus of the people who are planning the event as well. So um, I do my prep in that regard. I talk a lot to the to the client, whoever it is, and um, find out what yeah the hope is, the goal of the night, and go from there. I do quite a lot of prep. I write, I always write a script um, after I get sort of the key messages that they want, and I don't always stick to the script. Sometimes I'm either really funny that night and people are getting it and they're digging it, or they are not, and it's like we'll just stick to your knitting, just got to get through, um, and that's and that's fine. Um, that's awesome, Shay. I'm just looking at my notes here. Any other things you wanted to tick off? You, you mentioned Hagley Oval just before. Um, how special was it to host, in talking about MCM, to host the opening of the 2015 Cricket World Cup at your home ground? Was that an, an I was added rare. kind of bonus? It was awesome. It was such a highlight in my career. It was cool. I loved that I got to do it with Matt and Jerry as well. Um, uh, I'll tell you a secret about that uh, night. God, I've only had one glass of champagne. Um, and it was one of those bougie little bottles as well that I got on a hamper. And I don't know how old it was, so I don't know what's happened. Um, uh, so everything was going really well. Matt and Jeremy were only doing half the show, and then I was continuing on. And I'd, like, practiced in the shower, like, please welcome the news. Shape shifter. Like, I was just, like, never like, I'd always wanted to do Christmas in the Park. I wanted to sing in Christmas in the Park. So I was like, this is my time. And if someone says Laura sang a song, you best get your sweet little ass ready. And, <laughs> no, but um, so it's fine. Um, there was a, a, a great moment where um, I can't actually remember the name of the girl who was singing. She was up on stage and I had to stand in, in the middle of the stage and, and the teams would circle around me and then walk back. And my mother has managed Ross Taylor since he was, I think, about eight, 17 or 18. And um, New Zealand was obviously one of the last teams to come on. And I'm standing there and I get to go, New Zealand and their captain, Brendan McCollum. And then he, <laughs> everyone walks around me and like, for some reason, the team started getting closer and because I was supposed to take like quite a wide berth around me, and they just kept getting closer and closer and closer. So close, in fact, that Ross leans in and goes, "You're doing a really good job, Laura." <laughs> you can just hear it billow out across Hagley Oval, uh, Hagley Park. And Ross goes, "You're doing a really good job, Laura." And then um, I was like, "Oh God, oh, thanks, Ross." Again. Um, great. So that all happens, and then I had to welcome John Key and the ICC president Dave Richardson onto the stage, and. John Key does his speech, over to you, Big Dave, and Dave starts, and then he takes this pause, and he's only said about three sentences, I'm like, oh, well, okay, and then I just launch into a shapeshifter, and I have just, he had a four-minute speech prepared, and I just completely cut him off, I've got no idea what he wanted to say, I'm not sure anyone else did, I don't know if I did anyone a favour, but all I know is I completely, because I'd never seen his script, I didn't know what he was going to say. I was like, cool, well, that'll do you. Off you trot. Shoot, shoot. <laughs> and it was, um, yeah, he didn't, I don't think he loved me very much after that. Um, can you talk to us about the Harlem Globe Trotters of Cricket and the year you spent in the UK with lashings? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, what do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> wow. You really, you did some googling. Um, your lashings is was. I'm just interested in what it is and who they are, what they do. So lashings was a um, a, a cricket team, a cricket eleven that was um, brought to life by a guy called David Fulb, who is over in England. He had a, a pub called Lashings. Spent a lot of time in there, and he hired um, eleven of the best cricketers in the world at that time to travel around England and play games of club cricket against real cricket nuffies, people who just wanted to play the game and love cricket. We'd take um, marquees, we'd have lunches, charity auctions, different charities for different places that we were at, and then they'd have this game of cricket, this exhibition match against whatever, you know, whoever 
bought lashings for a day, effectively, if that makes sense. Um, and I helped with the organisation of it. Um, so there was, when the year I was there, there was Chris Harris, Sashin Tendulkar, uh, Greg Blewett, Herschel Gibbs, Ian Butler. Who the hell else was um, Oh, um, oh, that's so bad. I'm, I really am getting old. Um, an English cricketer whose name has escaped me, but I can remember the most inappropriate story about him. Um, <laughs> just give me a second. It'll come to me. John Embry. There you go. Um, who else is there? I've got to think of another. Henry Alonga, Brennan Taylor. Um, they, they would interchange a little bit as well, but those were the sort of the key players that I can remember. Um yeah, so we would uh, travel around England uh, watching a bunch of... Oh, Richie Richardson, Vicky Pardon was another, and um, yeah, so there was, there was quite a few. I could... God, I really... Where did you come from, Shane? Is it, I, was, I, I was actually... <laughs> like, you've actually... I'm a secret cricket nerd as well. Okay. So just hearing those names and kind of the thought of that team travelling around, there must have been some incredible stories which probably are best kept in the... Uh, in the pavilion, maybe. Well, push, turn the record button off. I'll tell you anything you want to know. No, no, I'm no. Um, I'll take those with me to the group. We, I had so much fun. I had such a great time. Chris Harris and his wife Linda were very heavily involved, and they took great care of me. Um, we had the oh my god, I had so much fun. It was wild. It was utterly bizarre. It was just fantastic. Like you went to some. We went to some. Alan Mullally was another one. I'm just thinking about Ireland. We missed our flight because we were in <laughs> we were in the pub. Um, and yeah, no, just a wonderful, wonderful time. Tino Best, he got sent home because he swore at a kid. <laughs> yeah, I, had, I have some stories. Mm. Yes. Mm. Well, buy um, me that dinner and we could all talk to you. Yeah, yeah, very good. Just to sort of close off the, the sort of career arc chat, um, MC, radio, TV, commentary, where do you see the journey going? Where's the next, what sort of shape will the next five years take, you reckon? Uh, I just want to keep doing it all. Um, I love it. I love my job. And I just would like to keep doing it. I'd like to keep doing more, some slightly different stuff. Um, there's a lot of cricket happening around the world that I'd like to be a part of. Like, I think the hundreds really cool. Um I enjoyed watching uh, some of that. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I've got a family as well, so I have to um, be realistic. I am not very good at saying no to things, but I really love doing my job. And it's important to me that I show particularly my daughter that we can, do, women, can do it all and they can have it all and, and be great mums and, you know, great at their job and keep it all together. And that's what my mum did. I watched her do it and I got a lot of my work ethic from her and my dad as well. So, um trying to trying to do all that over the next five years i don't know um there's a yeah there's more events coming up lots happening here in new zealand the women's cricket world cup is happening um early next year i really want to be a part of um the women's rugby world cup i really want to be a part of um it's just such a fantastic time to love sport as much as i do so hopefully there'll be more of me not less <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, that has been epic. We've covered so much ground. That's been so entertaining. And I'm such sure it hasn't. Place. And I am so sorry. I waffle. I get onto a story. We spent too long on the Cricket no, World no, Cup. No, Actually, no, no. Steve, before we, before we finish, can I say something and take it slightly slightly serious? Um, in, the, in the lead up to the podcast, I watched I watched your, um, your story on the hits where you spoke about falling pregnant with Teddy and the challenges that you'd had around the two miscarriages. Steve and I kicked this around beforehand about do we bring it up? It's you know it's, it's it's out there, and I sort of said to him, "Well, mate, as someone who's not married, clearly, and you will be invited to the wedding whenever that might happen." Shit, I can't wait. And someone who doesn't have children as well, I said, "Look, it if that happened to a friend of mine's wife or my niece or someone like that, I'd want to know how to react and how to." how to handle that and we talk about mental health in a men's sense quite openly and freely now we've normalized that conversation but around fertility issues i think that's actually really important for you to use your platform to talk about those sorts of things so that people like me can understand how to navigate it because it's a taboo subject so i just wanted to say continue to use that platform that you do have to push those sorts of messages because there are people that aren't female 
that do pick up and listen to it and think, fuck, actually, it's a really good way to handle it. And it's good that there's someone that's relatable that talks about it in a way that you understand. So thank you very much for, for that. Thank you for saying that. I really appreciate that. That's all right. All good. You can tell me about all the bad stories another time. Yeah, I will. No, there's no, there's no, there's no, no bad there. ones. Just interesting. Strong, strong finish. Um, yeah, thanks so much, Laura. That was amazing. Um, good luck on your future journey. Hopefully catch up in real life sometime when you guys are allowed out of your houses. I look forward to it. You owe me a lot of beer. I've told more stories on this than I think I've ever even told on the radio. So I look forward to it. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Cheers, Laura.